Well, hey, Bridgeway, how are we? We good? All right. Hey, it is uh, great to be with you. If we have not met, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here. Looking forward to getting into God's word with you this morning. Uh, first, a little, little story about me and kind of things going on in, in my life and my family right now. So see, I've got two little boys, uh, age seven and six. You might see me out with, the, out with them in the lobby after service, after this service. And love being a dad, love those kids. And something that, that sort of started crossing my wife and I's mind a couple of years ago with our boys is uh, neither of us are real big movie people. We don't watch a ton of movies, but we just thought we need to start showing our boys some movies. We need to start showing them some of the classics so they can learn the stories and sort of see what they're all about. Because I figure, you know, I got little kids, so I have, it is written in the stars that I will endure a trip to Disneyland sometime in the future, and it is something to be endured. And if we're going to do that, our kids need to know the stories and who all these characters are and, and what's going on. So, so we started looking for different movies we could show our kids, but this is what we found. And I don't know if you're in this same sort of young parent season of life kind of deal, maybe you found this as well, but this is what we found as we started looking for movies to show our kids. The movies are scary. <laughs> like, like, at what age does Ursula stop being terrifying? Like, I don't know, but I have not yet reached that age, all right? Like, and, and in fact, a couple summers ago, we were on vacation in Montana, and as part of our vacation, we decided to go to a play because The Little Mermaid was showing in the town we were in, and when Ursula came out on stage, I'm like comforting my child while getting ready to like shriek myself. She is even more terrifying in real life. <laughs> or, or look at a movie like Toy Story, and you've got Sid, the neighbor, like, this is a delightful individual that I would like for my kids to learn from. Sid, the blowing up toy guy, right? And there's all the sort of the scariness that happens in that movie. Or you look at, like, The Lion King, and there's a, here I am, I'm a dad, going to show my boys a movie where, hey, 15 minutes in, there's a stampede, and a young child's dad is tragically killed. Watch it, and we'll discuss it later. It should be excellent for your mental health, right? <laughs> I'm like, the, like, how are we not all, maybe we're all traumatized by these stories and we don't realize, like, these stories are scary, right? Or, or, or here's another thing that I, I had this great idea, I share this with you just to show you what a, what a wise and compassionate father I am. So earlier this summer, my family, we had the opportunity to get away just for a couple, couple days and we went to Yosemite. And in fact, here's a picture of my boys, real small in the picture there, in front of El Capitan, one of the most famous landmarks in Yosemite, which if you've never been there, El Capitan is amazing. It's over 3,000 feet tall and it, climbers come from all over the world to climb El Capitan. In fact, what you can do from that very field where you're standing is if you have binoculars, you can look up and you can see the climbers climbing and you can just have just a moment where you thank God that you are not them. And <laughs> it's incredible to watch these people and, and, and what it is they're doing. So, so we have this trip and have a great time and we come home and then I think to myself, you know what I'm going to do? Since my boys have had this experience in Yosemite and they've seen El Capitan, uh, I'm going to show them the last 15 minutes of the movie Free Solo. More people in the nine o'clock service had seen Free Solo, judging by your reaction. Which if you have not seen Free Solo, first of all, you must see Free Solo. It is absolutely mesmerizing. Here's what it's about. It is a documentary about a guy who's actually from this area who does not just have a screw loose, this guy is completely insane. And in fact, to call him completely insane is to insult other completely insane people. So here's what his, his, this is his deal, is he is a, he's a climber, and what he decided he was going to do was that he was going to climb El Capitan free solo, meaning by himself, no ropes. Insane. And they filmed it. And the cinematography is unbelievable. And the movie is sort of the build up to the big climb. And then the last 15 minutes is him climbing. And obviously the people filming, they don't know if he's going to make it. And I decide I'm going to show my impressionable, sensitive young children this movie. And uh, here's my son, Joey, watching uh, the movie. This was him. And um, the TV is behind him, by the way. Uh, <laughs> He is not having it. And, and I, once again, I know what you're thinking, dad of the year, but it gets better, is that I decide, I'm just like, you know, we're just going to watch it. I'm not going to tell him that he makes it. <laughs> so Joey is, is not having it. And then finally, eventually, I just say, Joey, 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 he, he makes it. I, I promise you, he makes it. You said you didn't know if he makes it. Joey, I've seen the movie. He makes it. 
And then finally he turned around and sort of watched and I took that picture and sent it to my wife and I'm still married, so praise the Lord. Um, <laughs> Dad of the year, I, once again, I know. But, but, but here, here's the point. My, my point is, and that's just a silly example. But my point is, in a lot of even kids' movies, they're scary, there's tension, there's villains, there's a challenge to overcome. But here's the deal. Uh, this is something my wife and I have had to talk about. Is as much as we don't really like that these movies are scary, the fact is, if you don't have tension, you don't have a story. Like, if you don't have an obstacle to overcome, a villain to defeat, you don't have a story. I remember about 10 years ago, I decided I just wanted to kind of bone up on my writing skills, and I read a bunch of books on, on writing, and, and I don't, I don't, not, I'm not a screenwriter, but I just read one book on screenwriting. And in the book... The author said that in every great story, you have in every great movie, every great screenplay, you have what is called the all is lost moment. And I probably don't need to explain to you what the all is lost moment is, right? It's that point of the movie, it comes about two thirds of the way through where the bottom drops out where there is seemingly no hope for our protagonist or our protagonists. They reach that moment of despair. And then in any great story, they reach the moment of despair, and the rest of the movie is them climbing out of it towards some sort of resolution. And the truth of the matter is, all his lost moments don't only come on the screen as we watch them. They happen in our lives, too. So some of you, even as I'm talking about the concept, you're remembering specific moments in your life where you experienced your own all is lost moment. Maybe, maybe for a lot of you, you would say that I experienced that moment. It altered the trajectory of my life, but what I know to be true is that God met me there. And, and maybe you experience this, as the scriptures say in Psalm 34, that God is near to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Or maybe you even experience what, what I love this quote from C.S. Lewis, how, how he says that God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain that pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Maybe pain functioned that way for you. Or maybe you're walking through your all is lost moment today where the fact of the matter is you would just say, you know what, I'm just in it right now. I don't have the perspective to look back and see the hand of God just yet. I'm more in the place of, of the psalmist in Psalm 13 verse one when he wrote, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? See, these all, of, all is lost moments don't just happen in works of fiction, they happen in our lives as well. And it's from those all is lost moments that we begin to rebuild, that we begin to be restored, that, that with God's help, something beautiful is built out of the ashes of those moments. We're starting a new series today, and, in this, and then today and in the next three weeks, four weeks total, we're gonna talk about the idea of what does it look like to rebuild? What does it look like to experience restoration? We're gonna see God restoring the nation of Israel and just ask the question, what would it look like to experience restoration in our own lives? The series is called Cleaning Up the Kingdom and we're gonna be studying another obscure Old Testament book. If you've been around this year, you know this is like the year of obscure Old Testament books and it's gonna be a book called Zechariah. And if you've got a Bible, I wanna invite you to open to Zechariah chapter one. We're not going to get into the, the text for a bit, but it might be helpful for you to have it open in front of you. If you're using the Bible underneath the seat in front of you, it's on page 793. If you're using your own Bible, save yourself the headache. Just go to the table of contents. You'll be glad you did. But that's where we're going to be. And you might be asking the question, okay, really? Uh, never heard a sermon on Zechariah. Why? Why are we studying uh, this book? And there are a couple of reasons. Number one is that we've spent all of this year studying Israel's history throughout 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. And then after this series, we're going to spend the rest of this year in the New Testament, have a couple of New Testament series coming up after this. And this book of Zechariah is it just, it makes an excellent bridge between the Old Testament, his, Old Testament history and then New Testament, which we're going to study starting here in a couple of weeks. It's also a book that, I mean, it's an obscure book. Not a lot of people read, about, read it much or study it or anything like that, but it is a book that is represented all throughout the New Testament. In fact, there's not complete agreement with how many references to Zechariah are in the New Testament because some of them, it's a little bit ambiguous, but scholars place the number at about 67 or 68 places in the New Testament where the book of Zechariah 
is quoted. We're also going to study it because this profound concept of restoration is so powerful. And as God restored Israel, again, we just want to ask the question, where do we need personal restoration? Where do our families need restoration? Where might our church need restoration? How can we be agents of restoration in the city around us? in the culture around us. And I'll tell you something that's just kind of a cool reason why we're studying the book of Zechariah is after we finish this series, out of the 66 books in the New Testament, there will only be four books of the Bible left that have not been studied and preached on here at Bridgeway in Pastor Lance's tenure, which to me, I think that's pretty awesome and is just a testament to our senior pastor's heart to teach the full counsel of God, amen? I think that's pretty cool. That in his... Now 21 years, we'll have covered 62 books. And in case you're thinking, great, I'm sure all the ones left are really weird and obscure. Are we going to do all of them next year? No, we will not, I promise you. I don't know when we're going to teach them. We'll do it eventually, but not all at once, I promise you that. So here's what we're going to do this morning. Is Number one, we need to talk about Israel's history a little bit here because we need to set the table for the book of Zechariah and understand the context. If you've been at Bridgeway for any length of time, you know that we teach context is critical. And then we're just going to have a quick sort of broad overview of the book from beginning to end. And then in our last 10, 15 minutes, we're just going to look at the first six verses. And this is a 14 chapter book and we're covering it in four weeks and I'm only doing six verses today. So we're going to pick up the pace quite a bit after this. But these first six verses, I just think are so powerful at saying sort of what was going on in Israel that led to their restoration. And there's a lot that we can glean if we're just in a place today where we feel like we need restoration. So, so first the history component. We, we've been studying throughout this year Israel's history and their different kings and leaders and all of that. And while Israel had a lot of good moments and a lot of bad moments, I think it's fair to say that the, the, gen, the general trajectory of Israel was going down, right? Was going down. And in 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered. And they were conquered because of years, decades of disobedience. It was an act of God's judgment. And then in 586 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah is conquered by the Babylonians. Jerusalem is destroyed, and the people are brought out into exile. If you want to talk about sort of the grand story of Scripture, this is Israel's all is lost moment. The temple is destroyed, Jerusalem is in ruins, and now they are in exile. And I think it's difficult for us to understand as 21st century Christ followers, just the importance of the land to those people. That their identity as the people of God was so wrapped up in the land that now to have the land destroyed, the temple destroyed, and to be in a foreign land was almost unimaginable. Reflecting back on this experience years later, the psalmist would write in Psalm 137, verse 4, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Just asking the question, how can we even be who God has called us to be now that we're no longer in the land. It was, again, this was the all is lost moment in Israel's story. And yet it was even in the midst of this exile, exile that had been warned by, that warned by prophets like Jeremiah and Habakkuk. They had said, this is coming if you don't repent. And they didn't repent and the exile came. Even in the midst of this exile, what happens is God begins to speak to his people. And God begins to make promises to his people. In places like Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29, God begins to speak to his people. He says, he says listen, first of all, and I'm paraphrasing here, of course, he says, get comfortable in the land. You're going to stay for a while. Find spouses. Find spouses for your kids. Plant gardens. Build homes. Don't listen to the people that say this is only going to be for a short while. You're going to be here for 60, 70 years. But then he says, after that time has passed, you're going to turn to me, and you're going to find me, and I'm going to bring you back, that this exile will not be forever, that even in Israel's all is lost moment, there is God speaking words of restoration and hope and rebuilding and renewal and deliverance. And sure enough, time passes. And in 538 BC, the Babylonians are overthrown by the Persians, and the Persians had a king named Cyrus, Cyrus, a pagan king. And yet Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28 tells us that Cyrus is issued an edict, very cleverly called 
the Edict of Cyrus. And what it said was the Israelites could return to the land. Their 70 years were almost up. So the Bible says that 50,000 people return from exile to the land, and they're led by a governor named Zerubbabel, which I only share that name with you for any of you just thinking about baby names, just throwing it out there. Zerubbabel, it's an option. Not a good one, but it's an option. And then also a priest named Joshua, and they're going to factor more into our story next week. And what happens is they get back to the land and there's all this enthusiasm. We've returned to the land. God is with us. New things are going to happen. And they immediately start to build because the temple was so central to who they were. They immediately start to build the temple. 538 BC and the first couple chapters of, of the book of Ezra talk about this. And they're building and they're building and they're building. And then they complete the foundation of the temple. And in 536 BC, any of you that have ever tried to be involved in any sort of construction project ever are going to have a hard time believing this. But the construction project ran into some delays. I know, weird, hard to relate to. But you'll just have to trust me that it happened. Ezra chapter 4 says they ran into some discouragement. They ran into some criticism. And all of a sudden, construction grinds to a halt. And all of a sudden, maybe, maybe you've started a new project, a new venture, a new opportunity, and there was all this enthusiasm at the beginning, but then you realize, man, this is not what I thought this was going to be. And that was Israel in the 530s BC. These people who thought they were going to experience God's presence, they were going to experience a new temple, they were going to experience all this restoration, and what happens is life in the land is just hard. And this goes on for year after year after year. 529 BC, Cyrus is killed in battle. Time continues to pass. 522 BC, a new king takes the throne named Darius, spelled like the country music star, but not pronounced like the country music star, Darius. And Darius in Ezra chapter five, he begins to search for this edict of Cyrus and he finds it again. And in Ezra chapter six, he issues another decree saying, paraphrasing again, he's saying the temple needs to be rebuilt. The temple needs to be rebuilt. So now there's all this enthusiasm again to get the temple built. And at about 520 BC, two prophets begin to write. One is a prophet named Haggai. And if you turn, if you got your Bible open, you can turn one page to see the beginning of the prophet Haggai right here. He's writing at almost the exact same time as Zechariah. And he's writing to encourage the people saying, come on, let's get the temple built. Let's get the temple built. Let's get the temple built. And then the other prophet to write in that time was, of course, Zechariah. And Zechariah wanted to see the temple built as well. But what I think is so cool about the prophet Zechariah is he wasn't just interested in getting the temple built, that he was about encouraging the people, that he was about the spiritual renewal of the people, that he understood that restoration starts with spiritual renewal, people returning to the Lord. So that is so much of the message of his book, to encourage the people, but also to say, turn back to the Lord. Turn back to the Lord. Turn back to the Lord. So this book, this obscure book that we only ever read when we're reading through the Bible in a year. <laughs> and even then, we're tempted to skip it. <laughs> it comes at such a powerful time in Israel's history. They've been through their all is lost moment. That They've started to rebuild. They've run into some trouble. And now, finally, things are starting to move. And what I think is so powerful about all of the prophets that write during this time, prophets like Haggai and Ezra and Nehemiah and Zechariah, is they write with such hope, they write with such power. They're people who are encouraging the people of God to move forward after years of stagnation. And as I look at these prophets, here's what I see in them, and I think there's so much we can learn from them that is applicable to our lives today. These change agents, these people that were able to move things forward, why were they able to do that? I believe they were able to do that because, number one, they were men of vision. And this can apply to men or women, but these guys were all men, so we'll just say that. They were men of vision, that they saw the future God had for them, and they wanted to pursue it. And then, number two, these were men of character. Because right? if you and I, if we have vision without character, then we will use and abuse people in service to our vision, and the ends never justify the means. These were men of vision. These were men of character. And then number three, these were men of great spiritual power. 
These were men of great spiritual power. They lived deep with their God. They were connected to their God. And because of those three things, vision, character, spiritual power, they were able to move things forward. I was at a conference with a couple friends from our staff in May in Texas, just church leadership conference, and heard all sorts of great stuff from a lot of different people. They brought in pastors and business leaders and everything else. And I remember this one talk that really made an impression on me. It was from a woman who I'd never heard of her before, but her whole job is she goes into troubled companies and helps sort of turn them around. And what she had done is she had spent a number of years as the CEO of Popeye's Chicken. And she was able, in the course of her time at Popeye's Chicken, take them from a struggling brand on the verge of going out of business and led them on an incredible transformation where I know we don't have a lot of Popeyes in this area, but they are absolutely thriving today in large part because of her leadership. And this is a woman who's a passionate follower of Jesus. And I'm listening to her and I'm like, man, this is a woman of vision. This is a woman of character. And this is a woman of extraordinary spiritual power. And I'm thinking, man, like I don't care about Popeye's Chicken. I don't even eat chicken. I could not care less about Popeye's chicken. And I'm inspired by her story. And I'm thinking, man, if someone with those characteristics can bring about revival in a chicken restaurant, (laughs) how about the people of God bringing revival in the church? How about the people of God bringing revival to our culture? How about men and women, you and me, just ordinary people with vision, character, and spiritual power to bring about restoration? Man, that's so inspiring. And that's the sort of thing we get from Zechariah. We see a man of vision, character, spiritual power, leading his people to what's next, leading them out of that place of the all is lost moment and into what's next. It's absolutely powerful. So now as we get into just sort of an overview of the book, it starts, if you look in your Bible on page 793, there's just a little six verse introduction. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about that now because we're going to go through that line by line at the end. But then after that, starting in chapter 1, verse 7, through chap- through, through, all the way through chapter 6, there's a series of eight visions. And these visions, if you know your New Testament, these visions would be right at home in the book of Revelation. And that is my way of saying they are very weird. All right, you are gonna read these visions. And if you ever had one of those nights where you just wake up and you're like almost disturbed at how weird your dream was, you will feel better after reading these visions. Come back next week. We're gonna talk about these visions and just have a weird good time doing it. But there's a lot in there for us, even for us to understand. Because the fact is that the idea that God would speak through dreams is is a biblical idea. You go to the book of Genesis and you look at people like Jacob and and Joseph and even the, the pagan Pharaoh. God speaks to them in their dreams. Sometimes these dreams are about the future. And sometimes these dreams are about discerning the present. And we're going to see a little bit of both of those things in the book of Zechariah. It's absolutely powerful stuff that God communicates. And then in chapter 7 and 8 is a really interesting sort of transition point in the book. Well, what happens is Zechariah is awake now. (laughs) And people come to him. And these are people who had been mourning the collapse of Jerusalem. They'd been mourning the devastation that had befallen Jerusalem. And they come to Zechariah, and I'm paraphrasing, and they say, Zechariah, is our time of mourning over? Is this time where we've been weeping and fasting and mourning, has that time come to an end? Is it time to rejoice now? Is the kingdom of God coming? Is this promised restoration going to happen? And what Zechariah does is he essentially turns it back on them. As he says, I don't know, you tell me, are you prepared to be the sort of person that can live into God's kingdom when it comes? Are you prepared to hold up your end of the covenant? Are you prepared to be faithful to who God has called you to be? And I love what happens because I just love when the Bible just gives us these questions but doesn't resolve them for us because that's exactly what happens here. These questions are posed and we don't get an answer. The people don't answer. It just moves on to the next portion. And then the rest of the book, chapters 9 through 14, are these series of prophetic poems and visions once again. The first vision is in chapters 9 through 11. And what it is, is it's a, a, commentators and scholars believe that this is a prophecy regarding Christ's first coming. In fact, chapter 9 talks about a Messiah entering Jerusalem riding a donkey, which if you know your New Testament, that's exactly what happened in the life of Jesus. But what happens in this vision 
is that this Messiah is rejected by the people, that the religious leaders and the people are, 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 are illustrated by, as sheep and shepherds. And what happens is they reject this Messiah. And then we're left with the question in chapter 11, is this rejection, is Israel's rejection of their Messiah gonna last forever? And then the final section of the book is a much more later, even more future vision that scholars believe is a reference to the second coming. Because this second vision seems to answer that question of will this rejection last forever? And the answer seems to be no. And what we get in the vision is a picture of a new Jerusalem, a place that is safe and secure, where God has defeated the evil in the nations, that God has purified the evil in Jerusalem. And that now Jerusalem is a secure place with God as their king and the people from all over the world can come and gather in the city to worship God together. And all throughout the book, but especially in these visions, there is the continued refrain of this call to faithfulness. That God's people, both individually and as a group, are called, listen, they say your past is that there was disobedience in your past. But what you're called to in the presence is faithfulness today, both individually and as a community. That's one of the key themes to this book. Other commentators, a commentator I read this week said that Zechariah is the prophet of encouragement and hope in troubled times. I don't know about you, but I think we live in some troubled times. There are troubles in pretty much all times. And we need some encouragement and hope, and we're going to find it in the book of Zechariah. And then also I referenced this a moment ago that a key theme in Zechariah is it is an incredibly messianic text. There are all sorts of prophecies about Jesus. If you're into Old Testament prophecy, man, Zechariah is like a hidden diamond with so much there. You look at like Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. It talks about a branch that is to come. Branch is a metaphor that is used for Jesus in the Old Testament. I already referenced Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, which prophesies about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem near the end of his life. Zechariah 11 references 30 pieces of silver, which scholars believe is an allusion to the price that Judas was paid to betray Jesus. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, there is a reference to Israel mourning the one that they have pierced, a reference to Israel's remorse and mourning over the death of the Messiah. And then Jesus himself in Matthew 28, verse 31, he cites the, a, a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 13, verse seven, saying, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. It's a familiar Old Te or New Testament quotation. And it's right from the book of Zechariah. We're gonna see that Jesus is all over this book. Jesus is all over the book of Zechariah. Another key theme is just the promise of God to be good to his people. There's, if, you, if you've been with us or we've studied these different prophets, there's lots of promises of judgment in a lot of Old Testament prophets because of Israel's disobedience. That what we see in the prophet Zechariah is a shift to promises of hope. In fact, throughout the book, there are over 50 instances in only 14 chapters of God promising to do good to Jerusalem. There are so many promises of hope, so many promises of restoration, and we're going to see that again and again. Last thing before we get in to the text itself is if you know your Hebrew history or you know your Old Testament, you know that in Hebrew culture, names are not random, that names aren't just sort of what parents picked out of a baby book that names maybe describe the circumstances of your birth or that God would appoint names to say something about the character of a person or what God wanted to communicate through that person. And I love that the name Zechariah literally means God remembers. God remembers. And so much of this book, it's a message I think so many of us need today. So much of the message of this book is that God remembers his people. God remembers his promises, that God is faithful. So we're going to be encouraged by those things as we read this book. And, and here's, here's sort of the big thing we're going to see. This is the fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you if you are following along either with that or on the app. We're going to see throughout this series that God is in the business of restoration. That, that God is in the business of restoration. 
And there are some of us today who we need to hear that today. We're just, because we're in the all is lost moment, or maybe we're just barely stepping out of it, and we just need to be reminded that God is in the business of restoration. So we're going to just look through these six verses in our last time together here. And as we're going through these verses, I just want to ask you the question, where do you need restoration in your life? Where do you need restoration in your family? Where do you need restoration in an organization you're a part of? Because because here's the deal. If you if you took a physics class in high school, and if you did, I'm sorry to bring back that memory. But if you took a physics class in high school, you're familiar with the concept of inertia. Which inertia is a very simple idea, which all it tells us is that matter, any matter, will remain in the state that it's in until it's acted on by an outside force. So for example, if I set a ball down on this stage, assuming it's level, the ball is going to stay there until it is acted upon by an outside force, namely my foot, which will kick it hard enough to get it to move. And it would continue rolling that direction, and it'll keep doing that until it is acted upon by an outside force, namely the wall which will stop it, right? Because here's the deal. Inertia doesn't just exist for random matter. Inertia exists in our lives too. Inertia exists for individuals. Inertia exists for families and organizations. For some of us, there is inertia of dysfunction in our lives that exists because an outside force has not stepped in to counter it. And what I love about the prophet Zechariah and so many of these post-exilic Old Testament prophets is that they are that outside force for the people of Israel. And I just wonder as we spend four weeks studying this book together that maybe the Spirit of God might use this text to break some inertia in our own lives, to heal some dysfunction and to help us to make the changes we need to make. So as we open the text, where do we need restoration? And we'll stop every verse or two just to draw out some ideas. Zechariah chapter 1 starting in verse one. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo, saying, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Stop right there. First, real quick, if you turn back to Haggai, you will see that Haggai is literally writing two months before Zechariah, almost the exact same time, 520 B.C., And the message at the beginning of the book is very clear and very simple. God was angry with your forefathers. That Zechariah names the issue at hand. How, Israel, did you get to the place that you are in? God was angry with your forefathers because of your disobedience. And I love that Zechariah begins the book by naming this issue because here's the thing. Here's something that I've experienced in small, little environments, something I've experienced as a pastor, something I've experienced in my personal life, and something that I see in society at large is that when injustice, tension, dysfunction, you name it, any of those things, when they are named, they begin to lose their power. When they are named specifically, they begin to lose their power. There are some who would say about societal issues and injustice, especially things in the past, there are those who would say, oh, we need to, why are we still talking about these things? We should forget about these things. No, no, no. May we never forget about those things. Let's not live in the past, to be sure but let's name the injustice in the past. Let's name the tension we see today. Let's name the difficulties we see. Let's name the dysfunction that we see. Why? Because junk grows in the dark and it shrinks in the light. And if you and I are gonna break the power of these dysfunctional elements of our lives, if we're gonna find something to break the inertia that keeps us in dysfunction, a key component is we have to name what it is that is holding us back, specifically and clearly. Winston Churchill wasn't the first one who said it, but he's the reason that we all remember it. He says that those who do not remember history are condemned to repeat it. And there's a reason why we all sort of nod our heads when we hear that statement, because it's true. I get that it's kind of a cliche, but cliches exist for a reason, (laughs) because they're mostly, if not always, true. Zechariah says, God, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. So I want to ask you, what needs to be named in your history? What needs to be named in your present? What needs to be named in your past? 
Because here's the thing, we talk about building a great story, naming what is broken is critical. When characters in great movies come out of their all is lost moment, they don't come out of it by forgetting the past. The past in some way factors into their ability to move forward. So what needs to be named in your past? Verse three, therefore say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Return to me, God says, and I will return to you. This is a constant refrain in scripture. Those exact words are found in Malachi chapter three, verse seven. And there are other places in scripture where they're found as well, where God's message to his people, God's message to you and I today is return to me and I will return to you. See, I think so many of us, maybe we, if we experience the all is lost moment and if we're really honest, we know that a good portion of that experience, it is our fault that we sort of brought it on ourselves, that there's there's part of us that says, no, I can't turn back to God now because if I turn back to God now, what he's going to say is like, well, you had your chance and you blew it. But that's just not true. That's just not true. Or maybe for some of us, we're just in a place of just sort of spiritual malaise and spiritual dormancy. We're not even really connected with the Lord. I've, I've been there. It's part of my story. And we think, that, no, I can't just, I can't get that fire back now because if I even try, God's going to be like, well, it's been a while. Where you been? No, no. The message of scripture again and again and again is return to me and I will return to you. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Or I think about the life of Jesus. When he first showed up on the scene in Mark chapter 1, Verse 14, verses 14 and 15, what did he say? What was his, his initial message as he starts his ministry? He says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. That even Jesus' message to the people was not, oh, well, your time has passed, sorry. His message was, no, no, God is here. The kingdom is at hand. And he said, repent. And Pastor Brian talked about that earlier. I love what he said. Repent, and he's right, literally means to change your mind that God invites us to change our mind, to change our thinking, so that we might shift from our own destructive thought patterns into healthy thought patterns that are honoring to him. And I get that repentance is a, is a scary word in a lot of places, and people use it to beat people up, and that is a misuse of the word repentance. Because listen, God's invitation to repentance is exactly that, a beautiful invitation. That God says, you do not have to be stuck in your dysfunction, you can repent and you can turn towards me. And then God continually invites us to believe. And see, we get belief wrong in our culture as well, because too often we think, do you believe something is like checking yes on the agree, in the, like the agree box or something like that. The yes, I intellectually believe something to be true. Like I believe there is a country called Japan that exists on the other side of the world right now. But when the Bible says believe, that's not what it's talking about. When Jesus calls us to believe, it's more like this. I believe this stage is going to support my weight. None of you are sitting there going, yeah, I don't think he believes that. Because you see why I'm putting my faith in this stage. I'm standing on the stage. See, repentance is a thought. Belief is an action. That God's continual invitation to us, turn to me and I will turn to you. And then what can you do? You can repent. You can change your thinking. And as you change your thinking, you can begin to walk in faith. That's what belief is. See, part of our restoration, in fact, I would submit to you that the beginning of our restoration is not do better and try harder. You might need to make some changes, but the beginning of our restoration is us turning to the Lord in repentance and faith, to turn to him and to know that he will turn to us. Verse four, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out, thus says the Lord of hosts, Return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your father, or, no, sorry, we're going to stop right there. They did not hear me, declares the Lord. And this command, do not be like your fathers, is powerful. He says, listen, this is what your fathers did to get you into this place. Do not be like them. This reminds me of a book I'm reading right now with our, our Next Gen staff, so all of the leaders of our ministries from Kidsway all the way through Young Adults. We're reading a book called Emotionally Healthy Leadership. 
We're reading it because I want them and I want myself. I want us to be emotionally healthy as we seek to lead you and lead our young people. And in the book, there's this incredible part where the author, he's a pastor in New York, and he talks about how part of emotionally healthy leadership is understanding where you came from and understanding how your past influences your present. And what he says, he says, this is a phrase he says they use at their church all the time. He says, Jesus might live in your heart, but grandpa lives in your bones. <laughs> Jesus might live in your heart, but grandpa might live in your bones. And that's really true that you and I, for better or worse, we are a product of where we came from. That the characteristics and traits that we have did not just appear out of nowhere. But as we look up our family trees, we can find them there. Pretty much everything I like about myself, I can look up my family tree and see somebody. It's like, all right, cool, thanks, Uncle So-and-so, right? But the fact of the matter is, we can see our dysfunction as well. <laughs> I know I love my family. I'm so blessed with great parents and a great family, but I know that part of carrying the name Kylie is that I have a hard time with talking about how I'm doing emotionally and really connecting in that way. And that I need to pay attention to that and I need to learn to be comfortable sharing my heart in ways and to know that it's not just whining because that's what it feels like sometimes. And if I'm honest, that's what it is sometimes. But that's just what it feels like, that I just need to be, if I'm gonna be emotionally healthy, if I'm gonna be healthy and whole, I need to recognize those things, I need to name them so I can combat them. And I just wonder, if you look at your past, if you look at your family history, what cycles of dysfunction need to be named so that they can be broken? Because dysfunction continues when we don't name it. Dysfunction continues when we ignore it. Dysfunction continues when we just pretend, oh, well, I'm just a blank slate and what came before me doesn't influence me. That is just not true. That is just not true. Jesus lives in your heart, but make no mistake about it. Grandpa, grandma, they are alive in your bones, right? So Zechariah says, don't forget the past. Remember what your fathers did. But then I love what he says in verse five. This is so powerful. He says, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statues, statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? Here's the good news. Does the negativity that we inherit from past generations live forever? No, it does not. No, it does not. Does it have the final word? No, it does not. Zechariah says, where are your ancestors? They're gone. Heck, where are the prophets? They're gone too. But what is still here? God's commands and God's statutes. Reminds me of a beautiful verse, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Right? See, so many of us, we inherit, we've inherited so much dysfunction in so many different ways. But we need to recognize that through the power of God's word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, our thinking can be reformed. We can repent so that we believe what is true and we break the cycle of negativity. So just to give a couple quick examples. See, some of you, you have been told, maybe by parents, maybe by bosses, maybe just by our culture, you have been told that the totality of your value is found in what you can produce and the success that you can find. And listen, I'm not against production, I'm not against success, but that is a cruel, false religion if there ever was one. And you need to recognize in Jesus' name that you are valuable in God's sight before you ever lift a finger. And that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you work from an identity, not for an identity, right? Or some of you, you grew up in environments where conflict was always toxic. Maybe you had to be the peacemaker at too early of an age. Maybe you carry those wounds from unhealthy conflict. And all you ever know is that conflict makes you afraid and that means that relationships are going to break down and people are going to be immature and everything else. And you need to recognize that actually when you're filled with the Spirit and you're mature, that conflict can be a healthy and important part of growth. See, some of you, you grew up in environments where you were told, hey, God has a great plan for your life, but um, don't screw it up. You were told if you make one false move, well, you blew it, good luck. That is not true. That is spiritual abuse. Those are scare tactics. You need to know the word of God stands forever. And hey, this is good news for you, good news for me. The plan of God cannot be thwarted by your foolishness. Anybody else like glory? Thank you, God, right? 
So I want, as I ask, where do you need restoration? I just need to know what negative messages have you received from your proverbial fathers, maybe your literal fathers? What messages have you received that you need to counteract them with the truth of God's word to know that it is the word of the Lord, the truth of the Lord that stands forever, that gives you an identity. Let's wrap this up. Verse six. So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with, with us for our ways and deeds. So has he dealt with us. How does this section finish? Zechariah gives his little speech and the people repent. They name it. They say, yeah, this is is who we have been. They acknowledge their past. They repent and say, God, we want to change our mind. The cycle of dysfunction stops here. We are naming what is broken and we're stepping into the future. So I ask you, where do you need restoration today? What cycles of dysfunction are there in your life and in your family that by the power of the Holy Spirit need to be broken? And come on, what we have for us today What we have today as 21st century Christ followers that those men and women all those years ago did not have is that we can look to Jesus who is the ultimate cycle breaker, right? What did Jesus do? Mark chapter two, the invalid crippled man gets brought by his friends. They have to lower him through a hole in the roof because they can't even get to Jesus and they lay the guy before Jesus and what does Jesus say? Well, this is all you're ever gonna be, man. You are dysfunctional and you are broken. Sorry about that. No, he says, your sins are forgiven. Now get up and walk. Jesus breaks the cycle. What does Jesus do for the man with the withered hand who comes to worship? He does not say, well, you're just always gonna be broken. He says, no, he heals, he touches him, and he heals him. What does he say to the leper who is, who is the outcast, who had, to be told, who had to shout out that he was unclean everywhere he went? Does Jesus reject him? No, he touches him, and the cleanness from Jesus heals the uncleanness in the man, and he says, go tell him what the Lord has done for you. The, the woman, come on, the woman who spent her whole life, her whole, so many years sick and spent all her money on doctors, she comes to touch Jesus. And what does Jesus say to her? Your faith has made you well. The cycle of brokenness in your life stops here. And come on, what is the cross if not a symbol that Jesus is the ultimate cycle breaker, that every bit of brokenness we bring, every bit of dysfunction that we bring, that Jesus did not say your life to deal with it on your own, that Jesus took it upon himself, it was nailed to the cross, and that he rose again in three days so that we might know our dysfunction will not have the final word. Somebody needs to hear that today, that restoration is possible for you because Jesus is alive. So here's what we're going to do. I'm over time. I never go over time. So we got to stop. Here's what I want you to do. If you're in a place today, this is how we're going to close. If you're in a place today where you would just say, I need restoration. I need restoration in my life. We want to pray for you today as a church family. And this isn't going to be weird or awkward or whatever. But all I'm going to ask you to do is if you're in a place where you're saying, I need, I'm in a place, I'm in my all is lost moment, or I'm just in a place where I know I need God's restoration in my life. I want to invite you to stand right where you're seated. I'm not going to call you up here or draw extra attention to you or anything else, but right now, right where you are, I want to invite you to stand and we're just going to pray for you right now. That's all we're going to do is we're going to pray. And anybody who's around you, as you see people stand around you, we got people over here, we got people over here. As you see people standing, here's all I want to encourage you to do. If you're around them, just maybe lay a hand on them to let them know you're with them. And I want, I need you to know this is not me praying and y'all watching. This is us praying together. And I want to show you something if you're standing right now. Because I think one of the great tricks the enemy pulls on us is when we're in that place that we start to believe we're alone. That we start to believe everybody else has it all figured out and that we're the only one who's hurting. I just want you to see that you're in a community of people who are hurting. You're in a community of people who need restoration. And now, once again, if you're next to somebody who's, who's standing, I just want to encourage you, go put a hand on them, and we're just going to pray for them together. And as soon as I say amen, our prayer team is going to be up front here. And if you would like further prayer for restoration, or if you're just carrying a burden today, 
where you just need God's healing touch, you can come forward and receive prayer. So let's all pray together. This is a congregational participation activity where we're all gonna pray together for our brothers and sisters and do battle for them. So God, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus that you are a God who is in the business of restoration. And God, we right now come to the defense of our brothers and sisters who are hurting, who know that they are in need of restoration in their personal lives, their need of restoration in marriages and families, their need of restorations in their workplaces or in their finances. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would begin to do what only you can do, and that is that you would build restoration in them. That out of their ashes, that something beautiful would arise. That out of their ashes, they would see you weaving together something that is beautiful. We thank you, God, that you are the ultimate chain breaker. Thank you that in this place today, we can stand with our brothers and sisters to even look around this room and see that we're not alone in our pain. Thank you that as we have hands that have been laid upon us in faith, that we can know we're surrounded by a church family that loves us and that is praying for us. So God, I thank you and I pray for all of us, those standing and the rest of us here, that God, would you do your restorative work in us? That where there is brokenness, that you would give us the courage and the faith to name it, that you would give us the courage and the faith to turn to you, that we would remember what has come before us so that we might walk in wholeness, and that God, as we live as people who have been restored, that the fruit of that restoration might be blessing in our community, that they might see our lives and know that you are a good God who brings restoration and that you would bring restoration to our whole community, our state, our country, and our world. So we thank you, Jesus, that because the tomb is empty, we can have hope for restoration. So do your restorative work in us, we pray. And we pray all of these things in the strong, powerful, mighty, living, restorative name of our Savior King Jesus. And everyone who agreed said, amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend.